First, it is an immense honour and pleasure, and I, I gained a, a enormous enjoyment from reading this book, which I have only done once on the plane yesterday. Uh, like all journalists, I believe only deadlines count. Um, it's a very important contribution to an immensely important subject, essentially nothing short of the future of the world. And, uh, and I admire much of it. It's brave, it's intelligent, and it's justly and rightly controversial. So much for the good things. No, that's not true. <laughs> I'm going to ask, as I always do, uh, questions. I'm going to ask five questions. I'll try and get through them as quickly as I can, because I'm sure there are, uh, there's much more to be said. First, I would like to ask whether and how far I believe uh, Arvind has measured economic power. And he, t he focused very much on economic power, arguing that that's the basis of all other forms of power. Has he measured it correctly? The second question, um, which Mohammed has already addressed, so I'll go through relatively quickly, but I have one or two points to make, is will China continue to rise in the relevant respects? Can we feel confident about that? The third question is, if you assume that China will continue to rise, as he described it, what sort of superpower might it be, and how would it compare, and some of these points already made, with the last two super or great powers of the world system, the UK and the US? The fourth question I'd like to, to address is, well, what role might we then expect China to play? What actions would uh, we expect it to, 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 um, to perform in the world system? And finally, which I think is the central question, issue, is what is the challenge for us all in managing the future? And here I have perhaps the most important criticism of the book, which is not that it's brave and bold, but that it's actually, in my view, far too limited it doesn't address a whole host of very deep and profound questions about how the world system would operate. So first of all, is economic power correctly measured? It seems to me there is no question at all, it cannot be, uh, if you look at the, the past, uh, uh, this is the, the great thesis of Paul Kennedy, that in the end, resources and the ability, and the ability to mobilize resources are the fundamental determinant of economic and probably all other forms of power. I think it's a co these are correctly measured as a mixture of PPP and market exchange GDP, and I have no problems with it. When you start turning to trade and finance, you have to recognize a very profound uh, problem, which is that these are both sources of influence and extreme sources of fragility at one and the same time. And I don't think I've been brought out quite enough for me the extent of the fragility. Um, there's a great deal of advantage in being a superpower with a rather small dependence on trade and particularly no dependence on essential imports. Very important point that the US had as a great advantage in the middle of the 20th century, which is largely lost. I'm very aware of this, as a, anyone from Britain would be, because we are all, any sensible Britain is aware that the decisive battles fought in both the First and Second World Wars was the Battle of the Atlantic. And the Battle of the Atlantic was crucial because if that had not been won, the country would have simply starved to death and collapsed. Its dependence on trade was an immense source of vulnerability. In the same way, China is moving in exactly the same direction. China is becoming, very rapidly, for the first time in its entire history, a country dependent for its standard of living, its daily economic activities, on resources, imports from the entire world. It's a source of influence. It's also a source of vulnerability. And the same of course applies for its, its massive reserves and its, uh, and its massive exports. Those depend on openness of other markets. Of course, China has some influence in that regard, but it can never completely determine the behavior of other markets. You mentioned specifically the idea that China has the loan, has the resources to save Europe. This is an idea many people have. It's always strikes me as very strange. China has, as I have pointed out to Chinese officials many times, accumulated through the efforts and diligence and hard work of its people a stock of three trillions in paper liabilities, a sum which the Federal Reserve is able to create in one microsecond. Uh, 
this doesn't seem to me uh, genuine power. So uh, I'm much more skeptical about using trade and finance as sources of power than Arvind is, and I would have stick largely with GDP. Um, I actually do think, by the way, the US was the most powerful country in the world in 1880. It's just that it and the rest of the world didn't realize it. There is a lag in realizing it, but the real legality is the US was the most important and powerful country in 1880, never mind Britain's trade. The second question, will China continue to, to rise and on these relevant dimensions? I think Arvin has been fairly cautious. You know, I never tell... For, um, I never forecast, especially the future. There are so many, anybody can produce scenarios in which China's growth collapses, uh, uh, and anybody can produce scenarios in which it continues even more rapidly. But I think his view of, that he has given of the likely growth potential of China, with one very important caveat, which I'm going to come to towards the end, is plausible. Uh, I think it is extremely likely that on most measures, of relevant economic size in terms of GDP, China will be clearly recognized as the biggest economy in the world within a rather short period. I've said the same, so I have no disagreement on that. The other dimensions are a little more problematic, and I'll just take up um, uh, two of them, one less important than the other. The first is trade. I think China has, in fact, overtraded very, very seriously, and I wouldn't be even surprised if its trade stagnated uh, in absolute terms and declined very steeply relative to GDP in the decades ahead. And therefore, the, the assumption that it will be completely dominant in world trade may turn out to be false. But the second and much more controversial point that I've been made was, of course, the idea that China will issue the principal world reserve currency within a decade. That's a pretty massive shift. Uh, I accept, by the way, his story. Uh, I think he's absolutely correct that the general view that it took 65 years to displace sterling is, is, is wrong. But this is extraordinary. And I have thought this for a very, very simple reason. And he doesn't address it at all, to, really, at all, uh, in this analysis. And it is that, to my mind, it is a necessary condition to produce a reserve currency, as he has mentioned, that this be a freely convertible, freely tradable asset which is available in deep domestic financial markets. In other words, China must integrate, despite all these bilateral deals, it must integrate its financial system with the world. For China to integrate its financial system in the world fully in the next 10 years, means that the Chinese government must give up its control over the single most important lever of economic control it has. And, and in a context in which it is seriously worried, and rightly so, about the capacity of the financial sector to wreak havoc and ruin on any decent, well-run society. We've seen plenty of examples of that recently. I do not believe they will do this. I simply don't believe they will do this, and therefore I believe that the US dollar will remain the reserve currency because the Chinese are too intelligent to adopt the policies that would displace it. Third question, I know I've only got a few minutes, uh, but I think I can deal with it in the relatively small amount of time. What will China have and what won't it have as a, a superpower if this basic forecast is correct? Well, it will have economic mass. There's no doubt it will have vast resources and it will have the potential to have a pretty big military for those who are excited about that sort of thing. Personally, I tend to think that the US military is the biggest worry, worry bead in the history of the world, but that's your problem. Now, uh, the, but it will not have some really important things the US has. And they're not just State Department lists. They are really important things. First of all, the, these are not mutually exclusive categories. <laughs> First of all, the US has shown, I think, an unrivaled capacity as a great power to form working alliances with other powers. I really doubt that ch China will find that possible. That's a really fundamental attribute of power. Secondly, the US will retain, and I think it's very unlikely that China will displace in this time period, a position on the frontier of technology, and that is certainly the US to lose, not China simply to gain. Third, it seems to me inconceivable that the cultural influence 
and the, link, and the advantage of having a world language will pass to China over this time period at least. And finally, fourth and finally, for all its problems, God, they are big. I still do not believe that anyone will find outside China the present political constitution of China a model to, uh, to, a model to identify with and to follow. So there are serious dimensions of power and influence that the US in particular and the West more broadly ought to be able to retain, and I think they count. My fourth question is what role might China play? And here I think his basic uh, approach to encouraging a multilateral engagement with China, uh, both in China's interest and in the rest of the world, is entirely and completely right. It's an argument I've made frequently. It's a central theme of this book. He emphasizes in trade, I would spread it much more broadly, but it seems to me incredibly important that that be the right engagement. We can easily imagine um, great power politics forming around and with uh, China and its neighbors, which will be immeasurably destructive. We've been through this before in our history, and we really can't afford to make that set of mistakes again. And the final question I wanted to address is what should the world do more specifically in uh, and what are in bubble is the agenda that this multilateral system which we need to develop should address. I have no problem, as I said, with trade. I differ with him on money. I'm assuming that the dollar will remain uh, the uh, principal reserve currency over the, this time period, at least over the next 10 years. But I would have liked him to address two other central issues, one perhaps too far from the competence of an economist, even as one as able as he, namely the security question, but I do think the question, the interaction between economic systems and security systems are going to become absolutely central in the question of how we deal with the rising China. And the final issue I would address is there are far more global public goods than just trade and finance. I am actually astonished in, in many levels, and this is the point I want to bring, that both in talking about the growth prospects for China and the rest of the emerging world, in terms of the, uh, of the management of the world economic system and our future, that no mention or almost no mention was made of resources, the environment, climate change, a whole slew of absolutely fundamental global public goods issues that we've got to share. So my criticism of the book, I suppose, in, a, in a certain respects, in the most fundamental respects is not that it's too ambitious, too frightening, too worrying, but that it's not ambitious and frightening enough. <laughs> the, we are facing a stupendous set of global, political, economic quest, uh, challenges, including long-term environmental challenges, that we have to handle collaboratively by pointing out the role that China will play and is playing uh, the book serves a valuable purpose, and I hope the reaction will not be one of, horrify, of horror and dismay here in the United States, but rather a determination to make this inevitable engagement fruitful, productive, and above all, peaceful. Thank you. Okay, thanks to all speakers, and I'll give Arvind a chance at the end to come back to his uh, discussions, but also to pick up on some other questions that uh, I think will be raised from the floor. So, the floor is open. We'll have uh, traveling mics and a standing mic in the back. Please identify yourself and then fire away. The floor is open. We have a stunned silence. <laughs> Question in the back and then Paul. Thank you, uh, Dong Hui Yu with the China Press. Uh, I have a question for Mr. Arvin. And, and you seem to be more optimistic than most Chinese people. <laughs> uh, because, you know, right now there are a lot of debates in China about uh, China model and Western model and the Beijing consensus and Washington consensus. And uh, even somebody compare China and India because they represent two kinds of uh, emerging country. So I just would like to know what's your view in this regard? Do you think China, Chinese model will be sustainable? Thank you. <laughs> 
Uh, there is one. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I'm often asked this uh, China-India comparison. First, let me just say that you know, when you say that many people worry within China, I think that's a, a, a very good thing. That and that itself is a sign that you know, it's the flip side of what Larry says about the U.S. That as long as we worry and as long as we are alarmist, we will take the action. And so that's a good sign. I think the China-India comparison, the way I look at it is the following, and slightly controversial, and I think maybe Mohammed and Martin might not agree with it. So I think that you know, if you look at long-run development, it requires two fundamentals. It requires a, an effective state, and it requires uh, 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 an environment for the private sector uh, to flourish. Now, if you look at India and China, I think both since 19, the late 70s, 80s, have given a larger role for markets and, and therefore entrepreneurship in the private sector are, are, are booming once again in both countries. But I think the capacity of the state is much better in China than in, in, in India. And I would go so far as to argue that, you know, all the political problems with that state, you know, the resource problems, the centralization, the things that Martin has referred to are absolutely right. But in the history of humanity, I don't think there's been as effective a state in delivering services and creating certain conditions as the Chinese state has been. And I would go so far as to argue that there's an asymmetry between markets and states. Being hustling is the natural condition. That will happen in both countries eventually. The private sector will grow in both countries eventually. But the state is a much more complicated, much more difficult thing to create, and much more difficult to reverse. India has a greater challenge on that score than, than China does. Paul? Do I need a microphone? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. First of all, to both the author and the panelists. Please identify. Okay. Paul Wolfowitz from American Enterprise Institute. Uh, very provocative and thought-provoking. Uh, it does seem to me, with all your uh, bold thinking about the future, that you're kind of projecting a straight line for China's political system, which strikes me as a very doubtful assumption. Uh, and uh, it's bizarre to have a country of 1.2 billion people whose government rests on the uh, on Marx's doctrine about the vanguard of the proletariat that no one believes in any more than people in England believe in the divine right of kings. So the real legitimacy of the government rests on this spectacular economic success, which I think to some extent means, I think Martin made the point, they're, they're more, this is a good thing on the whole, they're more vulnerable to shocks in the international system, therefore possibly more careful. But it does seem to me that that is very likely to change, and it may change much sooner than we think. Someone put together some statistics recently that suggest within about four or five years, uh, I think even on your conservative scenario, China's per capita income will be high enough that it will be the only country with that per capita income or higher in the Freedom House Index that is listed as unfree. Freedom House has free, partly free, unfree. Uh, I don't want to sound like an economic determinist, but maybe I am. I think there is a pattern here that when countries get richer, when their middle classes get bigger, demands on the system grow, and what you said about the virtues of the Chinese political system in the current environment may prove to be potentially weaknesses. I would say I'm not predicting, therefore, they won't keep going. I think more likely they will change. There will be a different set of problems, maybe bigger, maybe smaller, but I guess I'd be interested in any of the panelists addressing that. Paul, none of us here would accuse you of being an economic determinist. <laughs> <laughs> Came close. <laughs> Whoever wants to answer. Just, just two remarks. And I think Martin and Mohammed are more qualified to answer this than, than I am. Uh, but, but let me just say that you know this, of course, has been the million-dollar question about when you know we know three things that we know, we know the political change has to follow, has to happen. One, we have no clue when it will happen, and we know that when it happens, it will happen very quickly. Uh, I think uh, uh, that's kind of pretty. Uh, three things. But I think the important question from the point of view of this growth projection and economics is not whether political change will happen, is whether that will happen in a 
totally destructive, unmanaged and chaotic way, or whether it will happen with some bumps inevitably, but not be a complete uh, game changer from the point of view of economics, uh, you know, the investor climate and so on. And, you know, and that again, we don't really know, but at least a couple of the Asian transitions have been from economics to politics have been, you know, reasonably, and I say reasonably, non-disruptive. Very good. Martin? I think this is an incredibly important question, and in answering, I have the tremendous advantage of not having a clue, of course, because um, nobody really does, and, uh, and uh, uh, the, partly because it involves understanding enormously the, the, the nature of China and partly the, the possible political developments. So I'm just going to make the following two uh, uh, propositions one which is a heroic guess and the other is not, I think. The, the non-heroic guess is that whatever political transformation occurs, China will continue to be ruled by an entrenched and powerful bureaucratic elite. I believe that will remain the case and, and, uh, and I'll be very interested to see if that turns otherwise. Uh, and the second is I believe that it is overwhelmingly likely that they will manage this transition given the, the level of income they will have in a reasonably uh, um, stable, uh, stable manner and the more relevant transitions will be those of other countries in their neighborhood. Next question in the back. Thank you. Uh, Carl Dahlman, Georgetown University. I want to uh, thank Arvin for a fantastic book and also the comments by Mohammed and Martin are great. Uh, I have a book coming out uh, next month by Stanford called The World Under Pressure, How China and India Are Influencing the Global Economy and Environment. And it goes to the broader issues and I'm happy to discuss that. But what I want to pick up something that came up from, from the comments and also the fact that there's a general trend to believe that China is going to continue to, to grow and to be very strong is the implications for the U.S. And there I wanted Arvind to expand a little bit on your postscript because I think it's a very important one. You didn't touch on that. And basically, we're in a period of denial here in the U.S. at just how significant the challenge from China is. And you identify the issues which are there. There hasn't been enough dialogue about, about that. And I would suggest that the Peterson Institute also foster more discussion of the structural issues and the income distribution issues and the political issues which are at stake. Because unless we can get our act together, it's going to be much more difficult to be able to, to make it well in this new multilateral system that Arvind is, is suggesting. And I also wanted the commentators to also pick up on that because both of you talked about just how difficult the challenge is going to be for the U.S. Thanks. Uh, uh, thanks for uh, you know uh, uh, reading the postscript. I, I take it that you've read the, uh, the, all the pages preceding it. Uh, <laughs> that. Um, you know, uh, this is something that also it's, uh, I have it in my book, but I didn't touch upon my presentation. But Mohammed, you know, uh, uh, covered that very well. That I, I think that you know all the focus now in the U.S. Uh, is that you know there's a growth problem and a fiscal problem, a and I think I mean those are very real. Mohammed outlined them very well, uh, as did Martin. But I think the, the uh, underrated, under neglected point, which which Mohammed actually emphasized very nicely, is what I call the middle class beleaguered middle class problem. And I think um, uh, Larry Katz of, uh, at Harvard has a, has a very good metaphor for this, which is in my postscript, which is he says, the US is like an apartment block, which you know, 25 years ago was the envy of the neighborhood. Now, you know, the, to uh, the, the penthouses have gotten bigger, the middle floors have got squeezed, the basement is flooded, and above all, the elevator from the basement is, is broken. Uh -huh. so, 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 so the combination of pathologies surrounding the structural middle class problem is in some ways a, the bigger, biggest challenge, because that is about you know, the, the American dream for, for a lot of people. And it's, as Mohammed says, it's the most difficult to fix uh, in light of the, uh, in, in light of, uh, of the political you know, paralysis and, and the political system we have here. So that's why when people say, oh, uh, and Fred had this comment, very nice comment on my book, when he said, well, what if the US grows? Uh, what if we had a kind of Clinton-type growth, uh, which kind of saw off the Japanese threat you know, uh, 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 in the next decade. A and my response was that, A, Japan is not China. It has much more you know, headroom in terms of convergence. B, the US is much closer to its day of entitlement reckoning today than it was 20 years ago. A and three, the middle class problem has gotten worse. It's got more entrenched. And the old solution of, you know, let's move up the value added chain through education is, is actually 
not at all obvious that a that it's possible because of the political system, and b even if you did, uh, you know, uh, the flattened world certainly to some extent means that even at the upper end of the skill spectrum, it's not a vacuum waiting to be filled. Several questions up here. Yeah, right over here. And then, uh, Muhammad, sure. Uh, w one reaction to the question because I think it's, it's incredibly important, and it also speaks to why the U.S. and Europe are having such great problems. For very understandable reasons, the US and Europe lives in cyclical space. Emerging economies lives in, live in secular and structural space. So when the US and when Europe confront a major structural issue, the cyclical dominates. You see this in terms of the policy actions that have been taken both in Europe and the US, they've been mainly cyclical, mainly liquidity driven, rather than structural in nature. You see this in the way things are communicated. This word transitory dominates a lot. You also see it in the, in the way the policy is presented. It's all focused on the next quarter. It's all focused on the next year. Compare that to emerging markets. The emerging economies are very different. They have lived in secular, and structural space, like a teenager. Things change very quickly, and they can either change for the well, for the good, or for the bad. So you get, as we saw from the first question, what we call, um, back in my firm, constructive paranoia. Okay? Emerging economies tend to be much more pessimistic about their own outlook than other people looking at them. Okay? That's true for Brazil. If you look at the countries that have done really well, you get this constructive paranoia, because they recognize that structural issues are really hard. You also get a complete turnaround in how policy is formulated. So there's no hubris that you know all the next 10 steps. Instead, the policy is formulated completely differently. It sets out a vision, a five-year vision out there, 10-year vision. It says, this is our destination. We do not know every step of the way. But what's important is to know the first few steps and then to have a process to course correct. And what we're seeing now is, is that the West, in order to deal with its issues, is going to have to change its mindset from a cyclical mindset to a structural and secular mindset. Right? And that, I think, is a major challenge um, that we face as a society, is to make that transition. Thank you. Right here. Uh, Philippe Legrain, uh, economic advisor to the President of the European Commission. Um, Arvin, you mentioned tail risks, and Mr. Enlerian, you mentioned um, uh, unthinkables that become reality. I mean, how unthinkable is a financial crisis uh, in uh, China? Um, and to what extent could the economic and uh, political consequences of that uh, derail uh, the vision that's been set out today? Mohammed, you want to answer that one? Sure. Um, presumably, you mean a domestic financial crisis. Yes. Um, there's been many. No, no, there's been many in China, right? There's been many, right? They've had to recapitalize their banks in a big way, and they're going to have to recapitalize the bank again, right? Um, the difference is that China has a lot more buffers, right? First, it has the buffer of the system, which doesn't amplify the crisis as quickly as the West. The West system tends to amplify, right? Their system dampens the crisis. Massive efficiency losses in that process, so it's not a costless. Secondly, they have buffers, right? It, it goes back seven years ago, they spent $60 billion recapitalizing their banks, right, because of the NPLs. So, you know, they go through. In fact, one thing that, that we have to realize is that China's growth is not very efficient growth, right? But they have the ability to, to manage that system. The West lost a lot of its buffers in the last few years. Can I just, this is so important. I'm going to be very brief, built on this. As long as China avoids opening its financial system to the world, and as long as the economy credibly continues to grow in the 6% and upwards range, it is almost impossible to imagine, in my view, a constellation of affairs that would create a financial crisis that would seriously destabilize the country. If they were to open the economy to the world, financial system to the world, and there were any doubt about the growth, given the size of their monetary stock relative even to their reserves, the capacity for crisis is enormous, which is why, in my view, this is a guess, they are far too intelligent to make so serious a mistake. And that is why Arvin is 
unfortunately, in my view, seriously mistaken, unfortunately, uh, uh, seriously mistaken his view that the renminbi will assume the burdens of reserve currency status any time soon. <laughs> There's it. Two very quick questions. One is for Arthur. Identify. Uh, pardon me? Identify. I'm oh, sorry, Nancy Birdsall, Center for Global Development. Thank you for your introduction. <laughs> earlier, everybody to know. Earlier, thank you. Um, first, I'd like Arvin to respond to this point that Martin raised, particularly on the trade side, perhaps, that uh, China's dependence on trade also creates a kind of fragility. And second, the other interesting thing that Martin raised, I'd just like to I don't know if it's a question for Martin or Arvin. Arvin has thought a lot about global public good issues. So I'd like him to sort of go there a little bit, especially on the climate issue, and just mention that it does seem to me we're in a world where we actually need China on an issue like climate. And we actually are getting China on an issue like climate. My colleague David Wheeler at the center has shown that China and even India are spending far more in sort of interventionist public policies on clean energy, once you adjust for per capita income, far more than the US. So maybe that's where the leadership will come from, and maybe that's a good thing, so that it sort of calls into question what seemed to be a concern of yours, Martin, about how China will operate in on global issues. Procedural point, we almost always end right on time at two, but we've got more questions, a hot topic, Nobody seems to be leaving. We've got great speakers, so I'm going to let it run an extra 10 to 15 minutes, keeping in mind that I want to give Arvin five minutes at the end to respond to his, uh, to his uh, discussions. Yeah, uh, so, some of that, uh, 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 luckily, uh, I can take up in response to Nancy, uh, because I think the, the easiest, uh, uh, you know, Martin has posed many tough questions, but, but the easy ones, uh, let me respond to, which have been raised by Nancy which is that actually uh, Aditya Mattu and I, who's sitting here, have a book called uh, uh, On Climate Change and International Cooperation. Uh, the title for our book is uh, A Green Print for Cooperation, uh, and, and uh, the, 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 which uh, Nancy has kindly agreed to bring out. And essentially, the, the, the thesis of that book is that we do need a completely different way of thinking about international cooperation on global public goods. And it's a measure of how far we are from that, that you know, you, in this town, Martin, over the next two, three days, it, all the talk will be more finance for you know, uh, to developing countries to, to take on some kind of climate change obligations, when in fact, I would argue, and this is something that hasn't come up, uh, you know, come up is that the tectonic shift that's taken place in the, in the international uh, environment is that the identity of debtors and creditors, of those who are able to make net transfers, has changed completely. And China has become a, a potentially a big uh, net creditor to the system. So that means that uh, uh, the way we think about uh, the green print for cooperation uh, uh, has to change. And that China and India have to have a much more important role to play. And in this book, Aditya and I argue on green print that the way this should happen is in the context of climate change is that the rich countries take on you know the obligations on carbon pricing early the poor countries contribute in kind of initially in non carbon pricing ways because they have the fiscal ability because you know of various other things and then one can think about a construct where there is a kind of new paradigm for cooperation so so martin getting there uh, not in this book, uh, so, so that's I think. Similarly, on, on trade, uh, you know, Aditya and I, we have this uh, a, a thing coming up called uh, a China Round uh, for the Future, and it builds it's exactly on the point that Nancy and Martin are raising. That you know, on the one hand, China has all this power, and in this uh, in the China Round, we're going to say explicitly that the scope for reciprocity exists precisely because of this two-way relationship. That you know, the world needs China to change its exchange rate policy, but China needs security of access on resources. So uh, the old WTO reciprocity mechanism, which has been kind of uh, in, in disuse because we have a Doha agenda, which is 
totally unambitious, totally irrelevant. Um, uh, it makes it appear as if the trading system is irrelevant when, it's, when that's not the case. Doha might be dead, the WTO is alive and well, and the fact of the two-wayness that both of you emphasize is precisely what Aditya and I are saying gives hope for starting a new round of multilateral trade negotiations. Next question up here. Thanks. I'm Steve Hirsch, our freelance journalist. Uh, I want to ask a question similar to what Paul Wolfowitz asked, but a little different. Uh, as you look at the development uh, prospects for China over the coming years, what role do you see uh, in, uh, in, in hindering that development, both of domestic uh, political disputes within China and those on China's periphery? And I realize that usually with these, both, with these sorts of studies, you stay away from those sorts of issues, but this is such a broad, the, uh, this is such a broad book. Uh, I think it's a legitimate question. Thanks. I, I, I will just answer one aspect of it and, and, and leave uh, uh, the rest to Martin. And you know, uh, uh, and now I answer this in my capacity a, a, as an Indian. Um, you know, um, you know, Bismarck famously said that you know the United States uh, managed to surround itself on two sides with weak neighbors and the other two sides with fish. Uh, <laughs> In India, unfortunately, does not have the, the luxury of this splendid isolation vis-a-vis -vis China. So, so it's, it's a much more fraught relationship. But I just want to emphasize the, the one aspect of the relationship that I think is, is really a cause for increasing kind of anxiety is, is, is water in the context of climate change. That, you know, uh, China has water disputes with each of its neighbors. Uh, right you know, from that side all the way to this side. And, and the reality is if you believe in climate change and if global water supplies are going to uh, 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 become scarce, then of course China's power um, actually increases even more because it's, it's the upstream state controlling uh, water resources to what, Martin, what, four, four, three, 60 to 70 percent of humanity. And I think that really, I think, complicates matters in a way that in some ways actually it reinforces my point about dominance because China will have more of the levers there. And if you look at Bill Klein, my colleague Bill Klein's study on, on the impact on agriculture, one of the interesting things that comes out is that China actually, Bill, correct me if I'm wrong, in, in a relative sense, actually on balance doesn't lose or gains marginally. So the whole climate change thing actually would, in some ways, I would argue, at least on these two limited scores, you know, reinforce a picture of dominance rather than diluting it. Question to that. Yes, uh, Sherm Katz, Center for Study of the Presidency. Thank you all for this excellent discussion. I was just going to invite Arvin uh, to respond to Martin's basic point that for political reasons, uh, the uh, yuan would never become uh, a reserve currency. And I wonder, is it Mohammed? And no, never. Oh, all right. Never. Okay. No, never. No, 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 we'll, get, we'll get Arvin in. Oh, by 2020. We'll, we'll, we'll get Arvin in here in just a minute to answer everything uh, that came up from the discussions. Okay, anybody else? Uh, yeah. Dick. Assuming that. Identify. The, uh, Richard Gardner, Columbia University. Assuming the dollar's dominance. Uh, as the world's reserve currency is on the way out at some point. What would the experts recommend as a way to have this transition done without a crisis? What's the role for the IMF, SDRs, and so on? Martin, why don't you take that and then I'll come back to um, I have, I have nothing brilliant to say. I, I certainly don't believe you can manage such a process through the IMF or the SDRs, or it, it's all completely absurd. The IMF is not structured to deal with superpower questions. The superpowers have been very careful to ensure that the IMF is not structured to deal with superpower <laughs> questions, and the Chinese will be as enthusiastic about this, indeed are as enthusiastic as the Americans were, uh, since the Americans meticulously created a regime designed to punish uh, the British and ended up punishing themselves. Now, the because they thought they'd be a creditor nation forever. How do you, how do you uh, handle this? It seems to me that uh, there are two possible scenarios for this process. One, a relatively benign one, which is in the perfectly normal market processes, which I think is what Arvin really has in mind, the perfectly benign market process, China becomes a more and more important trading 
partner for everybody. The, the renminbi uh, is internationalized in the natural way because the markets are open. People can own, own it and will own it. It's going to be a relatively sound currency issued by a country that really doesn't like inflation. Their attitude to inflation seems to me to be quite German. So, the, so people will be quite happy to hold it. And over time, we will all find ourselves owning this currency of this very important new international economic power. And we will own less of the dollars. There might be more dollars out there, but there will be far more renminbi. And it will all be smooth and wonderful, and nothing terrible will happen. And that's perfectly possible. That is perfectly possible. There is, of course, another possibility, which I think depends entirely on America, which is that America so screws up its affairs that at some point people say, actually, there's a tipping point. And people say, I really don't want to hold this at any price because it's going to be wiped out. And at that point, then, of course, you get a very serious run and countries have to introduce exchange controls and you're Britain. But then Britain had two world wars to get there. Uh, it is worth importantly, and he doesn't, Alvin doesn't mention this significantly, the, the British creditor status was destroyed, complete financial status was destroyed by two ruinous wars, and the United States would never make a mistake like that, would it? <laughs> I, I, I would simply add, first book I ever wrote was on this question, the international role of the dollar, and I think Martin's first scenario is by far the most likely. I don't think you have to manage the transition from one key currency to another. It evolves over time. The changes are gradual, and even if the U.S. does screw up big time, as it did to an important extent in the 70s, there was only a modest, fairly marginal change in the composition of international reserves. So I think it is likely. The, the British example does lead to a final exit question. Uh, you remember there were a series of international agreements in the 60s into the 70s uh, to finally wind up the role of sterling. Uh, and that was kind of an end game, but it was done on the sidelines. Didn't really have much effect on the market. So uh, unless this was really a, an ahistoric kind of development, I think that's the outcome. Mohammed, and then, then we'll go to Arvin for the final wrap-up and response to uh, all of the above that have been raised about his thoughts. So, Fred, I would add, not only it will evolve, it's evolving, yeah. right? Um, <coughs> as you noticed, I did not pick up the WinMB as the global reserve currency within 10 years. Some of you will say it's because I'm polite. Ex-ante, I was polite to Arvin. Ex-post, I was polite to Martin. Okay, so it was good. The reason why I didn't pick it up is because had I read a draft of the book, I would have told Arvin, drop that. Drop it. Okay, drop it for a number of reasons. First, it's unlikely to happen. And I agree with Martin, it's unlikely to happen. Second, it's going to divert the whole conversation away from the main hypothesis. You do not need it for the main hypothesis. Right? This is like... like provoking already on a provocative thing, and, 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 and you've got to be careful. Um, the stick in the tiger. That's right, right? Um, so, so while I would be with Martin saying it's really unlikely to happen, I would just add it doesn't change okay, the main issue. We, can have it, we, can, we could have had this whole discussion without Alvin ever mentioning the B as a global reserve currency within 10 years. No. Okay, Arvin. Final remarks are to you. Um, a a final remarks. I think, first of all, let me say uh, I want to thank Martin and, and Mohammed and, and all of you for coming uh, for, for great comments. Um, I, I don't know, you know, I think I would probably address two, you know, one uh, big comment that Mohammed made and maybe one big comment that Martin made. Um, Mohammed, I think, is, I think, exactly right in terms of the three responses to this that. You know, the, the, and, and Martin agrees. The, I, I don't think the fear really, or that China will grow much slower than kind of what all of us think. Uh, I don't think that's going to be the serious problem. I think it might be how uh, the, the world responds to that. And I think my, um, uh, you know, response to Mohammed would be that, um, you know, there are big uncertainties. I think the U.S. is going to be a key player in that. And if, if the U.S. you know restores some modicum of you know, sanity to politics, if that's possible, and, and responsibility uh, internally, then perhaps it mo won't be that difficult to manage, uh, you know, uh, the accommodating of China's rise. But I think if, you know, if China is kind of unbenign and, and kind of much more self-interested and less in terms of the externalities 
it imposes, and if the U.S. system is weak, then I think, you know, Mohammed, your scenario uh, is highly plausible. And then, of course, I'll have to write uh, another uh, 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 a agenda or an addendum uh, to the book. Um, I think Ma Martin made some, uh, you know, uh, extremely good points. I think um, one is, you know, what about the other dimensions of power? Mm. And, and you know, when I started writing this book, Martin, that was, you know, and Fred as well, you know, said, you know. Uh, uh, and as some of you said, you, know, you, can't, you can't neglect the security question, not because it's important, but because there are important linkages between uh, security and, uh, and those issues. Uh, and the way I, I kind of tried to uh, uh, you know, uh, deal with that en passant is to say in my first chapter that actually military power and economic power are highly correlated in history. So I don't add very much to at least to economic dominance by, by adding military power. But, but I think, I think that, has, that assumption has a cost, as, as Martin pointed out. And, and I think you know, uh, uh, that's something that certainly uh, one needs to think about. I think on, on the other dimension about, I mean, what more is important apart from economics, i.e. not the, the, uh, the State Department list, but you know, the, the capacity to forge alliances, you know, the culture, the whole soft power, the politics, I think you know, so, so my take on this is, is summarized in my kind of reaction to Martin's premature power, which, and I say, China is not so much a premature power as a, as a precocious power. And in, in the following sense, A, of course, it won't be poor when it becomes dominant, it will be middle income. But I think one needs to distinguish between two kinds of dominance, I think. One is the dominance that you get, uh, Martin, from, you know, actually being able to you know, get others to do what you want and assert yourself and you know, protect your own freedom. The other, I think, is, is kind of the, uh, the, the leadership that comes from inspiring followership. And, and I think uh, there, I think you're absolutely right that at this stage, given the politics, I mean, I mean in some ways, you know, India has more of that than, than, than China does. And, and that, I think, is an open question. And it will depend upon you know, the political transition and what kind of society China becomes. So certainly, you know, uh, there are some forms of dominance China will not be able to exercise for some time. Uh, you know, the dominance that requires inspiring, you know, being at the technological frontier, being a democracy, and so on. Um, it needs to get, find my last word, it needs to get its Bollywood mark. Let me thank all of you for coming, particularly our Chinese friends. And I want to pre-announce the next session of this type will be a Chinese response to these proposals. So we'll look to our Chinese friends to begin to think about that and generate. I want to thank in particular, of course, Martin and Mohammed for cutting into their very busy time here this weekend to share in our program today, but particularly, of course, to thank Arvin for his creative and uh, masterful presentation. We hope you all will continue to think about it, and uh, I appreciate deeply his setting us off on this conversation. Thanks to all.